afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sue Thomas, President-elect of City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 27th of February, 2009. Today we welcome Mayor Sam Adams, who will present his first State of the City Address as Mayor. But before we begin our program, I have some announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask that everyone in the room silence their cell phones and other noise-making devices. Thank you. We are pleased to acknowledge our Four Friday Forum corporate sponsors for this quarter whose generous financial support makes these Friday Forum programs possible. Our four corporate sponsors are UBS, Girding Edlin Development Company, Pacific Power, and The Standards. We would especially like to welcome our sponsors who are here with us today. If we did not have their support, we would not be here today. I would like to ask the Pacific Power table and our friends from UBS and Girding Edlin to please rise to be acknowledged. City Club depends upon the support of our sponsors to make these Friday Forums possible. If your company would like to sponsor the Friday Forums, please contact City Club. We thank all of our Friday Forum sponsors for their support this quarter. Next week, on March 6th, City Club welcomes three of Oregon's most influential judges. Judge Ellen Rosenblum of the Court of Oregon Court of Appeals and Multnomah County Circuit Court Judges Jean Maurer and Nan Waller will discuss with us the most vital issues in today's courts, including threats to judicial independence, the increasing prominence of conflict resolution, and the advent of special courts for at-risk populations such as foster children. Please join us to learn about this new order in the courts. On March 13th, we will hear about the implications of the economic stimulus package from PSU Department of Economics Chair Mary King in her lecture, The Sustainable New Deal. On March 20th, Michelle Boussard, Executive Director of Forest Park Conservancy, will talk about the future of this iconic Portland Park. Please join us for these and other upcoming Friday Forums. Next month, Citizens Read takes a literary journey from Brazil to Seattle in author Margaret Wilson's book, Dance Lest We All Fall Down, a story about creating a top quality educational center in a Brazilian shantytown. Agra member Cynthia Townsend will be selling this book in the registration area after the forum today. We encourage you to read this book and join Agra and our author Margaret Wilson for their discussion on March 25th. And now to our program. When Sam Adams was elected mayor in 2008, he likely never imagined that within 100 days of taking office, he would face two major and unexpected challenges, a personal controversy and the most severe economic crisis since the Great Depression. In normal times, a personal scandal might dwarf hard news. In today's economic times, the economy dwarfs all else. Like other major American cities, Portland is facing critical financial shortfalls. Here to speak with us about these critical issues and his plans to address them is Mayor Sam Adams. Sam first gravitated to politics as a student at the University of Oregon when he interned in Congressman Peter DeFazio's office. In 1987, Adams went to work for the Oregon House Democratic Campaign Committee and then for the Democratic Majority Leader, Carl Hostica. Sam turned his focus to Portland in 1991, where he successfully managed Veerkat's first campaign for mayor. At age 29, he became the first of 11 years as the youngest mayoral chief of staff in the city's history. Adams won a, first won a seat on the Pit Portland City Council in 2004, where he, was, where he was commissioner in charge of Portland's Office of Transportation and the Bureau of Environmental Services. Elected mayor in 2008, he is now the lead council member on economic development, planning and sustainability, education, arts and culture, and transportation. Please help me welcome Mayor Sam Adams.
Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for that generous introduction and my thanks to the Portland Civic City Club for hosting these civic discussions for all these so many years. Up front, I want to introduce uh, 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 some folks that are important to me in, in various aspects of my life. And uh, first amongst them, I'd like you to meet my, uh, my grandmother and my mother, uh, Marie Gibbons and Kara Gibbons. If you think I'm tough, spend a few minutes with my grandma. Uh-oh, I'm already in trouble. Uh, I'm going to recognize my colleagues on the council uh, as part of my remarks, but I'd, I'd like to recognize, uh, have some other folks stand up and, and have you join me in thanking them. First, I'd like to thank uh, the staff in the mayor's office who have been working their hearts out in very difficult circumstances. I think the best policy staff around, please stand up and join me in thanking them for their good work. And finally, if you're part of a mayor's cabinet, if you're uh, part of the city staff or great management of one of the bureaus at the city, or if you're part of the resurgent Portland Development Commission team, please stand up as well and say, hello, thank you for your work. We are fortunate people to live in a city so distinctive, so unique, so spunky. To live in a city of small city box, big hearts, and open minds. To be fortunate to live in a tri-county region that is economically better off than many other regions in this nation. But the world's economic problems have definitely come home to roost in our area. Just in the past year, 45,000 folks in our region are newly unemployed. That's like filling up the Memorial Coliseum almost four times. Others are still employed but are getting by with fewer hours, less wages, and more meager benefits. Still others live in fear of losing everything that they've worked for. And before I continue, I, I also want to uh, acknowledge that I've made, more, I've made life more difficult in these trying times. I've made a mistake, as has been well documented, and I am very sorry for the distraction that it has caused my colleagues, my family, my friends, and this city. And all I can ask for is that you judge me based not on my worst moment, but on the totality of my public service career and my love and dedication for this city. Thank you. Today I'm going to focus on how we can improve job security for more Portlanders by helping more Portland businesses succeed. How we will help those facing hardship right now as we lay out a new economic development strategy for the city for long-term prosperity and how we will do this all as quickly as possible. From the days of the fork in the Oregon Trail with one sign that, it's, that I've been told just had a sketched out pot of gold and an arrow to California, and another sign that had the words Oregon scratched in pointing to a very different place. Portland's ambitions have been to be a place of quality, not quantity. We have always been about how good, not how much. So with this value in mind, our job creation and economic development efforts need to be strategic and very strategic. In this cutthroat economy, Portland must focus on what we do best compared to anyone else in the world. We are lucky. 
We have many standout business clusters in this region and in this city, but five, but with five, we are more competitive than most other places. Advanced manufacturing, apparel and activewear design, marketing and sales, software and bioscience. But in one area, an area that is emerging as one of the fastest growth areas, that is clean technology and sustainable design, we do better than anyone else and we can do much more. Portland is often ranked as America's greenest city. We have been the living laboratory for clean technology and sustainable policy and practices. Sometimes we even make the world's top 10 list for most sustainable cities. Now we will set the goal for Portland to be the most sustainable city in the world, and in doing so, we will make Portland the hub for the global green economy. Yeah. <clears throat> it's about bringing together business and the environment, environmentalists. It's about bringing together academia and labor, for-profit, non-profit, the biggest long-term challenge we face is the double-sided coin, the two-sided coin of complacency and fear. Complacency in the form of those who read our national press about how great we are and thus feel like we can coast along with the way things are now. I urge you to resist this because as great as we are, we are only as great of what we will be and what we can be. Fear, the irrational fear, the kind of fear that risks putting a freeze on our creative process, the kind of fear that will keep us from taking smart risks now, even in the face of strong economic headwinds. These are the two things that stand in our way. But Portlanders can take comfort in the fact that we are changing city government to be more nimble and focused and responsive in these difficult times to help now those that are experiencing hardship. In just 39 working days, and it seems a lot more than 39 working days, but in just 39 working days in office, your city council has embraced the need for change and action. We are reorganizing the city's bureaus to improve the delivery of programs and services. We are cutting spending now, even though revenue shortfalls have not shown up on the city's bottom line, and we're doing that, we're cutting spending now to avoid deeper cuts later. We are reforming the city's budget to require bureau expenditures and revenues for the first time to be listed by programs and services so that we can more usefully be transparent to the public and we can prioritize what to save in a time of cuts. And with the great partnership of Ch Chair Ted Wheeler and Governor Ted Kulingowski, we've gained low interest FEMA business loans up to $2 million each uh, to help businesses that were walloped by the Arctic blast during the season that most businesses rely on to be profitable for the entire year. We are fast-tracking city construction spinning to get those jobs on the street in the ne next 18 months that otherwise would have been meted out over the next five years. And we've achieved a groundbreaking agreement for a new bi-state regional transportation partnership. And as we move forward, we are unfortunately though gonna be lo losing a great change agent. A change agent that unfortunately today is homesick in bed with the flu but nonetheless deserves our accolade. Our auditor, Gary Blackmer, has decided to move on and take a job as an auditor with the state. So watch out the rest of the cities in Oregon because Gary knows what he's doing. And I would like in his absence, because I know he's watching on the live broadcast on uh, the web, to give him a round of applause. He has been a fantastic auditor for this city. <clears throat> In a minute, I'm gonna describe how we hope to make Portland, how we will make Portland an even greener city, and in the process, use that foundation 
for an aggressive new economic and job creation strategy. But first I want to go through sort of three foundational questions and discuss them because they are inherent threats to our sustainable way of life and our efforts to become the most sustainable city and the most successful sustainable hub uh, for green businesses. The first question is, and often ask, doesn't being greener cost more money? Won't it make us less economically competitive? The answer is Portland has helped prove actually just the opposite. In fact, our sustainability has given us a competitive green dividend that helps our families save money and boost the economy. Portland-based economist Joe Courtright, working for the CEOs for Cities Foundation, said it best when he wrote about green the green economic dividend here in Portland. Quote, for some, our green streak is viewed as sort of an economic hair shirt. Portlanders deprive themselves of prosperity in the name of saving the environment. Skeptics view biking, transit, density, and urban growth boundaries as a kind of virtuous self-denial, well-meaning, but silly and uneconomic. Critics see the seeds of economic ruin. They claim planning policies, regulations that restrict use or access to resources impede growth and lower household income. And Joe writes, both the skeptics and critics are wrong. Being green means Portland save a bundle, and he's focused just on the piece of transportation, that Portlanders save a bundle on cars and gas, and that local residents have more money because of the transportation-related costs that they avoid to spend on other things they value, which in turn stimulates the economy, the green dividend. We can do more in other areas. Second question, what does, Portland, what does it mean for Portland to be the living laboratory of sustainability have to do with creating jobs? Do we really want to live in the laboratory? Well, almost every city in the world is now making the claim to being a green city. But few cities have the number of green workers and green businesses with actual hands-on experience, not just talking about being green, but building and rebuilding green, designing, manufacturing. Two examples I think best illustrate how we have made being green more prosperous for ourselves. In 2001, Portland became the first city in America to reintroduce the streetcars into the city transit network. Uh, now Congressman Earl Blumenauer was an early proponent of this, but we also have in the audience, and he deserves recognition because he helped sell uh, Portland's uh, streetcar story all over the nation. Uh, former city commissioner, uh, someone who's done a great job, Charlie Hales deserves our recognition today as well. Those streetcars that uh, Charlie helped get on the ground supported Portland's deserved reputation for planning and public transit. They attracted visitors from across the nation who want to see how we do it. And now, a Portland area business is actually manufacturing modern streetcars for the first time in America in decades. United Streetcar. And I want to ta take a special moment um, to acknowledge the work of Senator Ron Wyden, Jeff Merkley, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, my former boss, Congressman Peter DeFazio, for working to secure the federal investment in the expansion of the streetcar line. Thanks to the belief in our vision for a more sustainable economy, our congressmen have requested, and we've made it further than ever before. We're in the conference committee bill, the 40, last $45 million we need to get the streetcar over to the east side. Thank you, congressmen. A second example that is within our reach. Last week I was meeting with uh, Ditlev Ingel, the CEO of Vestas Wind Systems. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And I learned that his company's wind turbines um, come from 9,000 components. Nine, it takes 9,000 individual components to build the wind turbines. What if even a fraction of those components are built 
or distributed here in Portland, even a tenth of the components, that's 900 parts, hundreds of supplier companies, the potential for thousands of jobs, and an even stronger claim for a green economy. And the third question I have, often asked, what are the longest, sorry, what are the biggest long-term threats to our efforts to become the most sustainable city with the most successful, as the most successful sustainability hub. There are two. One is the unnecessary expansion of the urban growth boundary, and the other is our failure to more actively manage our roadways. I'm gonna discuss two, these two with a little bit of detail. The first long-term threat, in my opinion, to Portland's environmental sustainability efforts is any misguided expansions to the urban growth boundary. We simply cannot afford it. And by that I mean, and by that I mean, we have a limited amount of infrastructure dollars, especially a very limited amount when it comes to transportation dollars. And we stretch those dollars thinner and thinner when we expand the urban growth boundary. In fact, we do not even have the resources to, I would say, implement the necessary infrastructure to connect the expansions that have been done over the last three expansion cycles. And I don't think we ever will. We have billions of dollars in unmet maintenance needs just on the system we have within the, within the, the current region. And to think that we can continue to expand it and somehow come up with billions of dollars of money to connect to these, these outlying expansions is just simply not going to happen. My approach to focus on uh, creating the jobs and, and finding the employment land and development opportunities within the existing urban growth boundary. For the, to find the employment lands, we can clean up our brownfields. Um, we have, uh, just the other day, uh, Commissioner Fritz and I were in a meeting with uh, staff by PDC talking about our harbor-related brownfields. And the opportunity, if we work with the polluters and get them to pay and become productive partners, that we can see a benefit to the economy of $81 million. First, we clean up the brownfields. Second, we use the land within the existing urban growth boundary. And only then will we even consider an expansion to the urban growth boundary. The second long-term threat to Portland's environmental sustainability is the passive management of our vehicular roadways, especially freeways. And I know we're the world's leader in innovative transportation, but we are not a leader in our management of vehicular roadways. In fact, we're in the dark ages. Uh, ignoring the opportunity to more aggressively meet our climate protection goals, we tend to build freeways, roads and streets, and then walk away. Well, local leaders on both sides of the Columbia River, including Vancouver Mayor Royce Pollard, Metro President David Bragdon, Vancouver City Council Member Tim Levitt, Clark County Commissioner Steve Stewart, have offered a better approach for a performance-based active manage transportation management system and a district that will more actively manage the future new Columbia River crossing. As Mayor Pollard and I wrote in a co-authored opinion piece in the newspaper this week, done right, the project promises safer and more reliable multimodal travel for people and goods while reducing negative impacts on the environment. Done wrong, today's gridlock moves south to downtown Portland, and 20 years from now, the new bridge is once again filled with stop and go traffic. Now, I know the phrase performance-based active transportation management doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, and maybe the concept, and I know the concept because it is, it is uh, implemented more, more uh, readily in Europe and, and parts of Asia, and I know it is not well understood. So we liken it, this new cross-river partnership to a thermostat. You would not build a home heating and cooling system without a way to regulate the airflow and control the temperature based on the time of day outside conditions and who is using the rooms. Nor should we build a new freeway bridge or any new expansion of the freeway anywhere, might add, without a mechanism to adjust conditions for maximum efficiency. 
Just as you would at home, we will define the comfort zone for the new Columbia River crossing. And we propose that the bridge be built to accommodate up to three add drop lanes and three through lanes, 12 lanes total, accommodate up to 12 lane totals, total. But these lanes will not be created equal. Our new partnership agreement will determine how the lanes will be phased, activated and managed over the time to get the right mix of tolling, HOV and hot lanes, van pools, transit fares, programs to reduce vehicle miles traveled and pollution. And because our partnership recognizes that these decisions affect more than just the limited I-5 bridge influence area, we propose to actively assess and manage other impacted areas like the I-205 crossing and Rose Quarter. The Columbia River crossing will function much differently in 2030 than it does on opening day, which by the way is 2018. Technology will change, as will community needs. We share the belief that a performance-based thermostat is the best tool we have to ensure that the new bridge meets the current and future citizens. What we envision as an actively managed Columbia River crossing, no other jurisdiction in the nation has done. But we are determined to blaze a new trail towards smart transportation management and protect our investment for generations to come. It's a gutsy thing for any set of politicians to do, but to come together after almost 12 years of bickering on both sides of the river. I want to thank and I would ask you to thank folks to the north and partners to the south for helping to put this new compact together. Three questions done. Now let's talk about boosting Portland as a living laboratory for green and sustainable practices that again will serve as a foundation for a new economic development strategy. As I mentioned, one of Portland's competitive advantages is that we have more sustainable thinking and doing than almost any other city. In order to keep and enhance that advantage, we need to continue to push forward on what a sustainable Portland looks like. That's why today I'm announcing that this spring, the City of Portland and Multnomah County, together with the co-leadership of Jeff Kogan and the previous work of Dan Saltzman, will launch an ambitious new strategy to reduce the carbon emissions that cause climate change. Our city has a history of outstanding action to reduce carbon emissions, cutting back emissions to 1990 levels. Few cities, no city in, in North America and few cities in the world have done this but we need to do, do more. So together we propose to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050 and to accomplish this, I will bring a solid action-based plan to council by June. It will focus on the real steps we can take to cut the emissions while creating thousands of new green and sustainable jobs. And we will start with a 500 home pilot and move toward a citywide rollout by the end of the year. The cost of the work will be repaid over time on utility bills with the energy savings repaying the loan. Once the loan is paid off, the homeowner keeps the monthly savings, all the while enjoying the benefits of a more comfortable, more efficient, and more, val and more valuable home. And this creates jobs now and keeps money in Portland in the long run. It is a critical part of implementing the climate protection strategy and a great example of how we can reduce carbon emissions while strengthening our local economy. And it's a program that adds to our city's triple bottom line and is working to create long-term living wage jobs. Businesses need to act as well. Commercial buildings are a big user of electricity. And remember, 42% of Portland's electricity comes from coal-fired plants in Boardman, Oregon, and the Rocky Mountains. Not all of our power comes from the dams. And that is why today I'm pleased to also announce that in order to help businesses reduce their carbon emissions and their energy bills, to those who use local suppliers, we will offer a local tax credit of up to $5,000 to businesses that install solar energy systems in the next two years. I know you're thinking, solar in rainy Oregon. Well, Portland has better conditions for solar energy production than Germany, the world's leader in solar installation. Portland's going solar, folks.
Now this city is a world leader in green building practices. We have more LEED buildings and more LEED accredited builders than any city in the region, but like all sustainability endeavors, we're facing stiff competition from cities all over the globe. When I had uh, coffee with Mayor Daly, he knew the number of LEED certified green buildings in Portland, and he said, I'm gonna catch up and I'm gonna conquer you people in Portland. <laughs> well, we're not gonna sit by idly. Imagine a future where every building constructed in Portland produces more energy than it consumes, where buildings are part of, not a burden on, the overall ecological health of the region. It may sound far-fetched, but innovators for green building are aiming for that goal right now. And that's why I support putting policies in place to ensure that the next generation of buildings is built at the highest possible level of energy and resource efficiency. And we're starting that now with new commercial construction. Soon we'll be moving forward a policy to reward new commercial building projects that meet higher sustainability standards. And as we do this, we will enhance and feature the sustainability of Portland's great retail districts, like the soon to be announced downtown signature real real retail district at the confluence of the streetcar, light rail, bus, and biking. And we will be greening local business and neighborhood retail districts like the Lentz Town Center, Gateway, and along Killingsworth. And in July, we will have selected a central city location for the first application in the city of the European style cycle tracks. Wait till you get on the cycle tracks, folks. You'll never want to get off. <laughs> yeah, give bikes a round of applause, somebody. <laughs> now, some sustainability achievements will be more challenging still. Take the north reach of the Willamette River, for example. It has the potential to one day house industrial companies that will employ thousands of workers. But as I alluded to before, it needs to be cleaned up. We need to ensure that we both restore both the ecological and economic functions of that piece of our city. And that means working closely with all stakeholders as partners in this vision. This is gonna be incredibly hard work. And it is vitally important for both our, but it is vitally important for both our economy and our environment. And that's why I'm so grateful that Commissioner Amanda Fritz has agreed to head up the effort. She is busy putting together the Office of Healthy Working Rivers, and I look forward to working with her and her team in making sure that we get the results that we want, all want, on the river. Commissioner Fritz, will you please stand up to be recognized way in the back. Now, just, it came in on the facts this morning, and uh, it's related to our efforts on the combined sewer overflow system. Uh, for about eight years, the first four Commissioner Saltzman was involved with, and the l previous four I was involved with, the city has had this running dispute with the Environmental Protection Agency. They wanted us to build even more pipes they wanted us to do even the application of what we consider non-green outmoded technology for a purpose that we thought was wasteful. It would have added an estimated, estimated $250 million to our sewer bills. And it has been a struggle. You might have read about it in the newspaper. So I'm very pleased today that it came, it came over on the facts this morning that the Environmental Protection Agency has agreed not to sue the city to build even more pipes for the sewer. We just potentially saved a quarter of a billion dollars, folks. Yeah. And, and uh, Senator Ron Wyden uh, needs to be singled out for special thanks. He fought them absolutely tooth and nail and he and his staff did a great job. We're very grateful. Now, as we do this work to make Portland a greener city, we need to make sure that it is done in a more equitable manner when it comes to geography within the city. Now, recently the Oregonian editorial board wagged their finger at me for asking for, no, I'm not talking about today's editorial. <laughs> For asking uh, for comparisons, 
of how city bureaus spend their money across the city for how city government, where city government, and how city government makes investments. Uh, the editorial board raised concerns that I might let my wonkish tendencies get the best of me and that I might be overburdening people with requests for too much data. Well, on this score, I make no apologies for seeking geographic equity for fair investment, and I know my colleagues on the city council feel the same. Every part of Portland deserves the full attention, and this city council is, in, is absolutely uh, committed to doing that. In fact, just last week, we, were, we held our council meeting in East Portland uh, to celebrate a great inclusive urban and community planning effort, the East Portland Action Plan, which is a model of community engagement. Now, you probably don't know about the East Portland Action Plan, but you should. It combines the community's top priorities with the strategic plan to deliver those priorities over the long term and the short term. And I want to thank the city's past mayor, Tom Potter, for his leadership in launching this effort, alongside Chair Ted Wheeler and now Senator Jeff Merkley. They put this plan together with the help of Commissioner Randy Leonard and East Portland is not only on the map, it's in the budget. <laughs> These sustainability efforts are as much about our quality of life as about creating a living laboratory for green excellence. But true sustainability must be part of, not apart from, our economic development and well-being. Portland's welcome mat is out to any business that wants to operate in a city with the values that we share. Our economic development plan is not just about promises, it's about results. Now, Oregon loves dreamers, but right now, Portland needs doers. And this economic development plan is based on real action items, real metrics, real accountability, and the five-year action plan rests on three equally critical pillars sustainable job growth. We will grow existing companies and attract firms in our targeted industries of clean tech apparel, design, advanced manufacturing, and software. Sustainable innovation. We will support the higher education institution and research efforts while putting on the ground eco districts, sites that will showcase the latest innovations in green building, infrastructure, and development. We have real opportunities in the Conway site in the Lloyd Crossing. We have real opportunities at the Rose Quarter, in freeway lands in East Portland, at the University of Portland District that's soon completing its master plan. And we will have inclusive prosperity. We will ensure that our workforce development efforts match our targeted industries so that we can be sure our city's graduate, graduates are ready to fill the jobs and build the companies that drive our city's green leadership. And we will work to ensure that minorities and women workers and business owners get their fair share for the first time of the opportunities they have so long sought for and deserve. <laughs> We're not waiting for the ink to dry or for even official approval to begin work on this new sustainably oriented economic development strategy. The time we live in cannot afford such waiting. That's why we have aggressively worked to recruit. I signed off on the largest incentive package for any company in the history of this city to land the opportunity to get Vestas here, a quarter billion dollars in private investment that it will leverage and up to 850 jobs and will pump in the kind of adrenaline that our green economic development need, needs more than ever. And I want to thank again the Portland Development Commission for their great work on this project. <laughs> Second economic, the federal economic stimulus. I am, and I know I speak for the council when I say this, that we are so grateful for the federal economic stimulus package. We are so incredibly grateful. But it does present some challenges. We expect the federal funding to come in in upwards of 67 different spigots of funding. 
It's coming with, as far as we know, with mostly the usual red tape and mandates and a couple of new ones. You have to buy USA, which is great if we can find all the products, and you have to turn dirt in days. It makes for bizarre and strange list making sometimes. But in the spirit, in the best Portland spirit and local spirit of cooperation, over 45 agencies have organized around the table to put this economic stimulus to work fast and to not only get people jobs, but to also have the companion training and education so that after two years of economic stimulus jobs, they are actually skilled up to continue to work at a higher level. And third, we're already making headway in establishing Portland's International Center of Excellence. There are over 100 centers of excellence, believe it or not, for sustainability in the United States. I think we have a, just a handful in Oregon. Well, the partnership with Governor Ted Kulingowski and the Oregon University System, we're pleased to announce that we have agreed on building the Oregon Sustainability Center and the future home of the Portland plus Oregon Sustainability Institute. I'd like you to meet the new executive director, Rob Bennett. And fourth, I'm pleased to announce today that we've recruited a hands-on expert in the for-profit sustainability industry. I'd like to introduce you to Steve Strauss. Steve, give him a round of applause. I'm recommending Steve to be the next candidate for the Portland Development Commission. And he brings experience and leadership in green building and it'll be perfect. Steve is president of Glumac, a building services engineering firm with offices in Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, Irving, and Las Vegas. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Steve leads a firm where all principals and associate principals are lead accredited professionals and are focused on and making a real impact on conserving our natural resources for projects big and small. And while we move forward on our economic development action plan, we're also finding ways to make green and sustainable projects easier to build in this city. I wanna thank my colleague on the City Council, Commissioner Randy Leonard, for his leadership over the years to improve the sometimes overly complicated and untimely permitting process. This, folks, is an incredibly thankless task but he does it with such a plum, and he does it with the real passion of someone who knows the importance of being smart in our permitting, but also being reliable and being effective. Please join me in thanking and welcoming City Commissioner Randy Leonard. But city efficiency won't get us all the way there uh, to where we need to be. To be truly competitive, both nationally and internationally, we're going to need to grow our creative capacity. To stoke the best innovation in sustainability, we have to be a very innovative and creative city. And soon, we will submit to the City Council the city's first ever creative capacity strategy, a plan to move aggressively to find dedicated resources for arts, operations, and new investments for our nonprofit and for-profit creative service industries, especially our small creative service firms. It's why I'm the first mayor in a generation to keep the arts and culture portfolio in the mayor's office with two dedicated staff to support the issue. And our efforts are already paying off. I'm uh, very pleased to announce that a successful TV series has chosen Portland to be its base for the next year, TNT's Leverage, starring I'm supposed to have a starring Academy Award winner, Timothy Hutton. <laughs> now remember, when you see him on the street at cool. <laughs> Hi, Timothy. Don't mob him. It'll start shooting uh, episodes here in the spring 
and it happened because the city of Portland worked speedily with the governor's office of film and television to pull together a package and secure the production and between the ask and when the governor's office and my office said yes was a total of two business days. This project will bring hundreds of jobs and millions of dollars of revenue to the Portland region. And if we want a truly sustainable economy, we must invest in our education and workforce development. We must ensure that our city has a workforce equipped with the skills and tools needed to build and sustain a green economy. But education is not just about workforce development and sustainability is not about the environment, just about the environment and the economy. True sustainability must include social equity. And it's in this sector that Portland has real work to do. With this in mind and in partnership with WSI and Multnomah County, I'm pleased today to announce that we will use $8 million of the federal economic stimulus package to train the unemployed, dislocated workers in basic skills, computer skills, vocational, English, and as, as a second language. And we will also use this money to pay for scholarships for online high school degree completion for adults. Why do this? Well, over 50% of the 100,000 people circling through the public workforce development system today read at a sixth grade level. There's an enormous need for basic skills training. And with Chair Ted Wheeler, I'm pleased to report progress on an emerging and unique integrated city and county strategy to deal with poverty, one person effectively at a time called the Prosperity Alliance to provide a better one-stop service seeking to help those to grow their skills and increasing their education. And look for an announcement this summer and I'd like to introduce uh, Ted Wheeler's Chief of Staff, Tom Reinhardt. He left. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ted. Next, I want to emphasize the importance of K through 18 education to our region's economy and livability. I want to share a staggering fact with you. In the state of California, decisions made about how many prison cells to build are partially based on the reading scores of California's third graders. And research shows that eight out of 10 gang members are disconnected from school by academic failure, suspensions, truancy, and dropout. Think about that. The chilling reality is that we pay for education or lack of investment in education one way or another. Here's another statistic that hits closer to home. As of now, Oregon spends 3.4 times as much per prisoner as per public school pupil. 3.4 times as much per prisoner than per public school pupil. Combine this with the fact that only 57% of Portland's eighth graders complete high school a 43% dropout rate. The number is even more staggering for communities of color. We cannot talk about being a sustainable city and a sustainable economy if we continue to allow this kind of failure on our part. Education has always been a priority for me, and that imperative is true now more than ever. I'd like you to meet one of the outstanding superintendents that we have in the city of Portland. And where's Karen? Karen Gray, Karen Gray, Karen Gray, please stand up. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Yes, the Park Rose School District is completely within the city of Portland. Now, Chair Ted Wheeler and I have set an ambitious target to cut by 50% the non-completion rate by 2013. Students that do not perform well academically in eighth grade are three times as likely to leave school. Identifying these students early and supporting them through key transition can increase their likelihood of success. And through the creation of the Portland Multnomah Youth Corps, we will contribute to increased graduation rates linked to academic support plus career and college exposure during the crucial summer months for youth at risk of not completing high school. And thanks to the $3 million of crucial financial support provided by the Federal Economic Stimulus Package, we'll be able to change the lives of tw up to 2,500 students by 2013.
To be a truly sustainable city, we have a basic need like education to be and feel safe. Now, Commissioner Dan Saltzman is a longtime colleague of mine, and I've always had confidence in his abilities. But many people said that only the mayor, the mayor's office, could oversee the police bureau. So when I announced that Dan would take on that responsibility, we all knew it would be a challenge he would take on with full faith. Well, I'm very glad to stand here and tell those naysayers that they were 100% wrong. The work that Dan has done alongside Police Chief Rosie Sizer has been nothing short of fantastic, whether it's been working to reduce the gang-related crime and deliver a successful Operation Cooldown for our neighborhoods, or working closely with the Police Bureau to reduce administrative expenses and get more officers on the streets and in the communities. If you want to know what a great commis police commissioner looks like, look no further than Dan Saltzman. Dan, thank you very much. <clears throat> Public safety is a priority for City Hall. It's about keeping Portland the most livable city in America. And we need to ensure that our city remains both a wonderful and affordable place to live. We don't want to be the worst aspects of Seattle or San Francisco, as great as those cities might be. They price many people out of the opportunity of living there. And that's why I'm very grateful for the work of Commissioner Nick Fish to answer the housing challenges of our city whether it's been his work continuing the 10-year plan to end homelessness or overseeing the newly organized Bureau of Housing, Nick has embraced his responsibilities with his usual gusto. And his work on affordable housing, especially green affordable housing, is to be commended. Thank you, Nick. Indeed. Portland, whether it's about planning neighborhoods or building businesses, knows we are better when we work together. Already, we're seeing the better together thinking happening across the city during these difficult times. One example is in our own arts community. One example is in our own nonprofit community. We need to nurture our greatest strengths, our sense of community, looking out for one another, our belief that a sustainable way of life is in sync with, not at odds with, a strong local economy and our innate drive to plan for the future, cultivate our resources, and share our bounty with each other. And speaking of bounty, many of you know that I'm a vegetable gardener. It's one of my favorite pastimes. In fact, it's one of my only pastimes. <laughs> but I'm working to change that. Um, it's a pastime that many Portlanders share. We're a great place for Farmers Markets, and the new executive director of the Farmers Markets is here. Stand up, take a bow, come on. <laughs> One amazing local nonprofit that doesn't get enough attention is Growing Gardens. For more than a decade, they've organized volunteers to build, or build organic raised bed vegetable gardens in backyards, front yards, side yards, and on balconies. They've taught Portlanders about the sense of ownership and self-reliance that growing your own food can deliver. I bring up the example of growing gardens because they embody so much of what we need to do as a community to survive this downturn and emerge a stronger and healthier city. I'm grateful to have their executive director here today, Deborah Lippold, so I can thank her, her staff, and the volunteers for all that you do for Portland. Thank you. In fact, Portland has always been better together. It is in our DNA. We've been through wars, depressions, and wrenching changes. There have been times when we thought we were broken. But in each of those times, we've always grown stronger in the broken places by sticking together. And so we will in this time of challenge. Our individual talents, resources, and efforts may fall short of perfection, but I believe to the core of my being that if we join the strengths of our people, and of our community, together we will be better. We will rise, and if we do it right, we will not just rise to the moment, but we will build a foundation that will make us, that will, that will, that will make this not just our year, but our decade, and create a future that is uniquely Portland. A prosperity that includes our values and all the people who call Portland their home. Our pioneer founders 
endured hardship almost unimaginable to us today just to get to a place to fulfill their dreams. This is still the place. We are still possessed, possessed of the legacy of spirit, hard work, and the vision of those who came before us. If we remain true to that legacy, we will achieve the dreams we have for our city and our future. And you can be sure that your city council is dedicated to the great task before us, and nobody is more humbled and grateful for the opportunity to serve you than I am. I want to thank you for attending today, and again, I want to thank the City Club. <laughs> what time is it? Thank you, Sam, for sharing your vision of the city with us. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from the Board of Governors host. Our board host today is Larry Wallach. Larry is Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University. Larry? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Adams. Mayor Adams, last month you said that almost three of ten Portlanders, 30 percent, are unemployed or make so little that they can barely afford basic essentials such as food. You've spoken today a lot about equity, and I was glad to hear that. You also talked about sustainability. Triple bottom line approaches to sustainability strive to balance economics, environment, and equity. But the equity line often gets ignored. What kinds of policies with teeth will you put in place to assure that the equity bottom line is adequately addressed and not sacrificed in the process? We, are, uh, we funded the single best opportunity is the use of the city's, how the city uh, uses its spending. It can help businesses get the hands-on experience and access to market, especially minority and women-owned businesses. We have an annual budget of about $2 billion. Uh, this city council funded, as required by court actions, a new disparity study, and that will tell us the disparity in this community when it comes to wealth creation and who actually has the opportunities to access that wealth. That disparity study is going to be led by uh, Commissioner Nick Fish um, and behind it and with the results we will have the legal basis on which to put teeth into the, set, the city's spending and be on a, have a platform in which to challenge other businesses to do equitable spending to uh, minorities and women as well. We'll now take questions from the floor. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership, and unfortunately, we don't have as much time as that line over there would like, so we'll get started. <laughs> I'll stay around afterwards to answer questions. All right. Hi, Sam. Chris Smith, City Club member. Um, Sam, I very much appreciate your remarks about uh, sustainability. I uh, appreciate your leadership in getting the streetcar across the river, and I'm honored to be a member of your transportation cabinet. But <laughs> I am very nervous about the Columbia River crossing, and I'm going to pick apart your thermostat analogy. Uh, I'm concerned that we're making, we're putting off the hard decisions about the performance criteria for this bridge to the future while we make decisions now that enable a bridge with a very large physical and environmental footprint. You know, it's not hard for me to imagine that Portland might argue with other jurisdictions in this region about whether that thermostat should be at 68 or 72. And I'm really worried that we just, built a, or we just agreed to build the furnace that could heat the house to 82. So how are we going to make sure that the hard choices actually happen and ensure against the, the easier political choices we're making now coming back to bite us? Well, the way the project has been envisioned in terms of decision making is for the project sponsors council to make decisions on these little pieces, number of lanes, tolls, design, uh, on ramps, off ramps. And yet we were going to be making those decisions without any sort of performance goals or sort of performance warranty in mind. And I object to that. I, don't, I think that form should follow function. And the agreement that we have among leaders that are behind this proposal 
is that we put together the performance goals first around land use, around uh, throughput, um, um, around every aspect of greenhouse gas emissions, and that we use that framework to then make decisions about other aspects of the bridge. And I think the best example of how passive we've been in terms of relying only on sort of the physical elements of our transportation system is the bridge we have now. Massive sprawl in Clark County. And there are only three lanes. Tim. Roche, uh, City Club member. I want to thank you, Sam, um, for recognizing the strategic importance of the uh, arts into the overall health of the city. But I want to ask you, uh, given the dramatic changes in Portland's cultural and economic ecosystem, and the challenge it's, it's presenting to cultural institutions and arts groups, both large and small, can you see the city putting resources behind the creation of a new comprehensive master plan, a la Arts Plan 2000 Plus, that uh, digs into what we didn't know in 1990 about impending population change, social equity and the, and the creative economy, and cultural vitality as a key component of our livability? Great question. The creative capacity strategy is a huge step towards that goal. Uh, what we lack, though, is adequate funding for arts and culture. We continue to lag behind other cities that we don't view as necessarily um, uh, peers in terms of innovation and, and cultural creativity. We lag behind public funding. Uh, that's got to change. Our pursuit in the future, perhaps years ahead of a de dedicated funding source for arts and culture, is absolutely necessary. This city has better arts and culture offerings than almost any other city its size, and yet most of them are just scraping by financially. I know we have more questions. We've come to the end of our time and need to officially adjourn. However, the mayor has said he would stay around and answer some more questions. So I will officially adjourn us now, and then we can um, conclude the broadcast. So if you still want to ask questions from the floor, you can do so. Mike, Rose, oh, Mike Rosen, City Club member. Um, Sam, this week the legislature announced that it was going to restore approximately $50 million of the $167 million in cuts to the state ed public education system. But even given that number, Carol Smith, the Portland Public School Superintendent, has announced that she can't even guarantee that we'll have a full school year this year. As you know that in Oregon, and in Portland in particular, we have the second shortest school year in the country by three weeks on average. My question is what you and the rest of City Council will do to guarantee that we have a full school year this year and all the years that you hold office. Well, that's part of the reason for bringing together those 45 different agencies that will likely get a, a piece of the stim federal stimulus resources. And even though many of them have prohibitions on, you know, obviously what different spigots of funding can be used for, how can we be creative uh, in, as we get the federal stimulus in keeping the school year as whole as possible for our public schools. It's one of the top priorities in bringing those groups together is to try to be as creative as possible with the federal stimulus money. Hello, uh, I'm Barb Wolf, a City Club member. Your, um, your speech has been very well received. You've touched on many wonderful aspects that all need attention. I'd like to go back to your first one, though, of transportation. Um, it seems that in a city where we talk about having um, less use of cars and more green use of it, this is the wrong time to cut back on our metro, um, you know, our, our public transportation, and that seems to be at risk right now. Yeah. Have you any ideas on that? <laughs> You're right. And um, I would say that of all the funding streams in the federal stimulus bill, the one that comes close, closer to others of being somewhat adequate is the funding that it'll be going to TriMet and other transit agencies. And it's one of the rare exceptions in the federal stimulus bill uh, that you can actually, TriMet will be able to use it for equipment and to a degree operations. And that will help them uh, keep as much service as possible. Um, they're very creative in what they do, but it is 
very difficult times for all public agencies, especially transit where the demand is up, um, but cost uh, continue to be a big driver as well. Hello, Mayor Adams. I'm Matt Newport, City Club member and avid cyclist as well. I have a transportation question for you. Thinking about uh, the economic situation that we're in now and trying to make Portland the most sustainable city, um, are you still committed to funding the bike programs you talked about in your Safe Sound and Green Streets and your 100-day plan? Yes. Um, the budget that um, has been presented to me and the City Council is, is the budget for the Portland Bureau of Transportation um, put together by a diverse group of, of inside and outside experts, uh, labor management. Um, I think they did an amazing job, uh, some aspects of it, uh, though I don't agree with. And as I put together my mayor's proposed budget, um, I'll be able to, hopefully, my goal will be to backfill some of the cuts that they've recommended, uh, for example, in the Safe Sound, uh, sorry, the Safer Routes to School program, and I actually think this is a time where we need to boost when people have less and less money and, and the bike trip being the cheapest trip and often the most reliable in terms of trip time, that now is a time for us to be increasing our investments in bike and pedestrian and transit, and I'm committed to doing that. We'll take one more question and then uh, the mayor will stay around for a few more minutes and answer additional questions. Thank you. Uh, Sam, John Russell, longtime City Club member, and another transportation question, if I may. Yes. A year or so ago, you convened 50 of us to take a look at increased transportation funding, and maybe more importantly, how those monies should best be spent. Is there a fit between our recommendations and the needs of the federal stimulus bill? The most frustrating, um, yes and no is the short answer. The longer answer is the federal stimulus bill as it relates to transportation is very paving centric. Um, I would, you know, we're, we're looking at, at all the fine print on all the stimulus dollars to see if we can not only do the needed paving where it's the worst, but there are parts of the city that just need sidewalks, you know, to and from schools, to and from bus stops and transit stops. So we're looking to see if we can be creative with the federal stimulus resources to do the paving, but also to do sidewalks. Half of Southwest Portland's busiest streets do not have sidewalks. About 25% of East Portland's busiest streets do not have sidewalks. We can't expect people to use the bus transportation system if there's no sidewalk, no crosswalk, no even adequate intersection for people to safely get across. We're out of time. I'll stick around for individual questions. Thank you very much.